All right, guys, it's our first lecture. We're going to start with glycolysis. Um, we're going to go through a little bit of the, the basics that we need to have behind glycolysis and uh, the idea of actually taking a single glucose molecule and converting it into adenosine triphosphate. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to break some bonds. Obviously, glucose has a nice hexagonal structure. We've got lots of bonds to break. Uh, to get single individual carbon dioxide molecules out of that, we're going to get some water too, but to go from a nice complex hexagonal glucose molecule to a bunch of carbon dioxide, we have to break bonds. And breaking bonds gives us energy, and we're going to use that energy to make ATP. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we're going to focus in this class about uh, basically this big dark blue line here, that's glycolysis, citric acid cycle, um, and then going into the electron transport chain. Now, if I simplify that a little bit, uh, we're going to focus on glycolysis here. Um, we're going to have a separate lecture, so the next lecture, so today's lecture is glycolysis. The next lecture is going to be on pyruvate, going to acetyl-CoA, uh, and some of the fates of pyruvate. And then we're going to go into the TCA cycle, which is tricarboxylic acid, otherwise known as the Krebs cycle. That's the person who did, uh, did a lot of the discovery for it, otherwise known as the citric acid cycle. So uh, I kind of use them all interchangeably, but I more most often will use citric acid cycle, uh, unless I'm showing a diagram that says TCA, and then I'll say TCA cycle. Uh, and then uh, the last lecture, we're going to talk about um, the electron transport chain and how that works. It's going to be great. And so just to reiterate here, we're going to focus mostly um, in one semester biochemistry courses, you get a lot of uh, the basics. So you get a lot of structure, um, you get some thermodynamics, and you get a lot of carbohydrate catabolism. So i.e. these four processes that we just talked about. So we're going to cover this one today and then we're going to do separate lectures for all the other ones. That's pretty typical for a biochemistry course, which is why I've set up this course this way. If you take a two semester biochemistry course, basically you would get uh, all of this and then you start going into other things like um, uh, carbohydrate anabolism, uh, some of the other anabolic processes, um, a lot of the other just um, pathways involved here, basically. Uh, and so for a one semester class like this, I really want you to get uh, the most out of it. And really, all you really need um, is to just have covered the things that we've covered. I mean, and this is the last one. Uh, some people like this section, some people don't. Um, I actually find that a lot of students prefer uh, getting into pathways and how things are actually done as opposed to some of the structural stuff. Now, before we get too deep into the actual steps of glycolysis, we need to talk about some of the background that we need uh, before we get a little too deep, okay? So one of the main ones is to think about thermodynamics. So just remember, orient yourself and your thoughts about um, carbohydrates, breaking energy, doing reactions. So we're going to focus a little bit. You're going to see, I'm going to mention the delta Gs of reactions a lot. So you have to remember, negative delta G is spontaneous, positive delta G is non-spontaneous. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it happens instantly. We're going to be focusing on things uh, that use enzymes, and a lot of these processes are happening, happening thousands of times a second. Um, so they have very rapid processes. But uh, we are going to be talking about spontaneity, because we're going to talk about how we get energy, right? So the whole point is to break some bonds, get some energy. I, this is the best diagram I can find. I apologize for the quality, but... Um, we have all this energy, and the chaos of the universe is always uh, becoming increased. Uh, another way to think about this is everything's going towards equilibrium, right? So, like, I have a hot cup of coffee right next to me. Uh, well, it used to be hot, and now it is not. Uh, it has given some of its heat away to the air around it, and so it has reached equilibrium. Well, that's the second law of thermodynamics. And what you can do is you can temporarily defy the second law. You can take energy, right? so we're going to take energy, i.e. glucose right there, we're going to break some bonds, take that energy, and we're going to use it to do some work. But eventually, we will always go to uh, absolute entropy, to absolute chaos. But that's not going to happen. That's like the heat death of the universe. That won't happen until you're way dead. So don't worry about it. So we're going to take some energy out. Wah, wah. We're going to take some energy out, and we're going to do some work with it, okay? Now, the main key here is ATP. You're going to see ATP all the time. That's going to be our easiest-to-use battery to actually charge stuff. Okay. And so I just want to remind you what we're going to be doing. When we're making ATP, we're charging our battery up, right? Mm -hmm. So that's when we have our ADP, or you could have AMP, or just adenosine. <laughs> and you're going to put some phosphates on there, either one, two, or three. And those phosphate bonds are really, really energetic. Um, phosphorus is a very strange atom um, as far as elements go. It can hold extra electrons. Um, and so it can hold those extra electrons. It can form more bonds than it should. 
which means uh, it's stable enough to form the bond, but it's unstable enough to break it really, really easy, and that releases energy. And that's usually what we're going to be doing. Okay? On this side, we're going to be taking that phosphate off, and that releases a bunch of energy. One of the important things to think about uh, as we're focusing on uh, delta G, spontaneity, heat release, all these things, uh, try and keep it simplified in your brain. Like we're just gonna take some food and we're gonna chop it up, get some energy out and make some ATP with it and use that to do stuff later. We're not even gonna talk about this anymore, okay? We're focusing on uh, what's basically exergonic reactions, okay? Now, not all of the reactions we're gonna be dealing with are exergonic. There are going to be some endergonic ones. So we need to talk about um, how we do that. But overall, the net uh, delta G is going to be negative. We're going to get some energy out. It's going to be exergonic, okay? And we're going to use that energy to make ATP, okay? How are we going to do that? Well, basically, we're going to be coupling a lot of reactions together. And so uh, it just, here's just one more diagram, one more version of this. This is just like a, I don't know, a sideways version of that. But uh, we're gonna get energy out and then we're gonna use it to do work, okay? So we're actually really just focusing on, we're gonna go down here and we're gonna get some glucose. Cause remember, I mean, uh, we've learned uh, when we have our saccharides, right? Uh, we're just gonna focus on this monosaccharide, but we have to get that to a monosaccharide state. And then we're going to break it down, do some stuff, and we're going to do a bunch of things. Now, uh, we're not focusing on uh, any of these processes except actually like getting energy out, okay? But I do want to point out, uh, if you take an, another biochemistry course, you will focus on these other processes, especially these anabolic ones that require energy. So you better understand where we're getting that energy from, all that ATP, before you study all these anabolic processes. Um, now, uh, just to reiterate, uh, exergonic versus endergonic. Uh, exergonic is when your delta G is less than zero, so it's negative. Okay? And this is how most of our uh, delta Gs are going to look, though we are going to have some positive delta Gs. So how do you go against that, right? It's non-spontaneous. Well, Spontaneity just refers to this. Am I going from reactants to products and is there an energy being released because the actual amount of energy uh, is uh, greater? Am I breaking bonds or not? Well, sometimes we can kind of defy that uh, by using the push and pull of um, coupling reactions together. And so there are a few ways that we do that. The main one is we can uh, increase concentration of one specific side or we can pull away the, uh, and reduce the concentration on the other side. So for instance, if I have a ton of substrate A, that's going to sort of, um, this gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and that pushes us into B. And so if B, the generation of B, is a non-spontaneous process, we can kind of overcome that using concentration gradients, okay? Uh, and so we're going to do that all the time and that's how uh, we're going to see this process of glycolysis, which we're about to spend a while talking about. Um, oh my gosh, look at all those things. Uh, we're gonna spend a ton of time talking about that. That's how we're doing this. So um, we will have a, a variety of intermediates, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're going to use a variety of enzymes to generate those intermediates. Some of them have positive delta Gs, but what we can do is we can pull away uh, the reactants or we can increase the amount, uh, sorry, we can pull away the products or we can increase the amount of reactants and really drive you through there tons of diagrams of glycolysis. Um, so I tried to include a, a couple of them in here. Uh, here's a really, really nice one from Pearson, which is a textbook company. Um, this one's great, great uh, pictures. Um, it's got all the enzymes. Uh, it's got all the steps. I love it. It's really, really nice. It's not the one that we're going to use. We're going to use a different one, but I do like to include other diagrams. So here's another one. Uh, this one, the quality looks awful. I realize that. I honestly cannot find a better version other than someone's scanned in version. Um, but this one is really great. It comes from Leninger's Biochemistry, which is the textbook that I recommend uh, if you want to dig deeper into all of these processes. It's the one that I use to actually supplement myself. Um, I don't think you have to have it because, uh, I don't know, I just don't think you need it. But if you would like one, you can get it. And um, it summarizes glycolysis, all the steps. Now notice it's not as good as this one because it doesn't have the actual pictures. Uh, I like the pictures. But it does have uh, the actual, uh, it's got your ATP yield, which we're about to talk about that. Uh, but it has your delta G as well, uh, which is really, really fun. Uh, and it shows that you're basically going to overall net 
have a negative delta G, which makes sense. We're breaking bonds, people, and we're going to break those bonds, and that gives us energy, and so therefore we have a negative delta G. Now, you can look at this diagram here. These are all the intermediate. Um, and so uh, these are all, like, you start with glucose, then you go glucose 6-phosphate, uh, fructose 6-phosphate, fructose bisphosphate, bisphosphate. We're going to go through all these. But notice that um, if we're looking at our delta G, some of these kind of kind of creep up, especially when you get to PEP. Now, that is a positive delta G, yes, but uh, so like, for instance, like uh, using an aldolase uh, to generate a gap in DHAP, uh, that does have a positive delta G, but our overall net delta G is negative, and that's the key, right? That's what makes overall this a catabolic process. Now, to keep ourselves oriented, I want you always thinking about um, the big picture, because we're about to get real nitty-gritty into the small picture of each step of glycolysis. Uh, hopefully it will help. It should make things a little bit clearer, uh, but always kind of keep the big process in mind. Okay, we need to take some sugar. We need to break those bonds and get that energy out. Awesome. And so we need to look at uh, overall what's going on. So if I have one glucose, and this is for maximum ATP yield, it's never this good, and we'll talk about why. Uh, but if uh, in a theoretical world where you could perfectly uh, take one glucose and catabol catabolic, catabolize it, catabolize it? I don't know. Uh, we're going to take that glucose and we're going to send it all the way. Uh, I'm skipping this. This is just a, a Khan Academy view of what's happening in glycolysis because uh, there's two sides to glycolysis. But um, so in glycolysis, we're going to get four ATP out via substrate level phosphorylation. We're going to talk about that. We're going to get a couple of NADHs, which is another uh, awesome battery that we can then send to the electron transport chain. And that will generate, in a perfect world, 6 ATP. Okay, So each NADH is approximately 3 ATP. Okay, And so, so we've got 4 that we made and plus 6. Okay, uh, Now, of course, we have to send it to another process, but that's fine. We're just going to kind of assume that's going to happen. And we get some pyruvate. We're going to send those through the acetyl-CoA process which we're separating out for this class because, I mean, it does generate its own two NADHs, okay, which that's another 6 ATP, and some carbon dioxide, so we're starting to get rid of that because uh, that's why we breathe out carbon dioxide is because we have to break uh, sugar, among other things. It doesn't have to be sugar, but that's just the simplest version. Uh, we're going to break that and get some carbons out, right? We're going to break some bonds. Uh, then we're going to go into the citric acid cycle. We're going to get a couple more ATP, uh, ATP slash GTP, it doesn't really matter, uh, but some substrate level phosphorylation, we're just going to call them ATP. Get some more NADHs, look at all that, oh, that is like where you get most of your energy from, that's so awesome. Uh, a couple FADHs to try and recover a little bit of that energy, and then the rest of your carbon dioxide. So remember, uh, carbohydrate, or carbohydrate really, glucose is C6H12O6, right? So we should have six carbons released, right? Glucose has six carbons, we need to release all six of those as CO2s. Well, two in acetyl-CoA, and four of them in the tricarboxylic acid cycle, there's your six, okay? Our equation balances, life has meaning once again. Now, if you add up all of these ATPs, it adds up to 40. Now, you will classically see 38 ATP listed as the total that you normally get from this entire process. So like this entire process going from glucose all the way through the citric acid cycle and into the electron transport chain. Um, why is that? Well, because we have to spend two ATP at the beginning, okay? So we have a net gain of two ATP from glycolysis, okay? So that's this part right here where we're going to add two ATP, and we're about to talk about that, so don't worry. But you got to spend a little bit of money to make a bunch of money. So we're going to spend two to get 40 out, and so our net total is 38, because we kind of subtract those two. So let's get into it. Each step of glycolysis I'm going to go through, I've basically got some fun facts for most of them. Um, <laughs> by fun facts, I mean, I don't know, they're important things. Uh, some of these steps have more than others. This first one is actually one of the most important ones. Uh, this is using hexokinase, okay? uh, which there's a couple other names. So uh, you'll see hexokinase and you'll also see glucokinase. We're going to have to spend some time talking about this uh, because this is a classic um, reaction that gets talked about a lot, especially in MCAT circles and doctor circles, because it involves uh, not only the liver, but other cells, as well as how we kind of control our blood glucose levels. So it's really, really important. Now, what's physically happening? Well, <laughs> the, the hydroxyl group, the alcohol on um, the C6 carbon, okay, that's your C6 carbon up here, is going to be a nucleophile and attack 
the a, the terminal phosphate. So that's just you know the phosphate on the end of ATP because there's three of them, right? It's going to attack the end one via an electrophilic. That's electrophilic. And it's going to be forming a nucleophilic attack. So that's like, if you haven't taken organic chemistry, then you might not know what I'm talking about. If you've taken it, you've heard it too many times, uh, and you probably even know it better than me, even though I took it. Um, I took organic chemistry like so long ago, uh, but uh, you didn't think you'd see nucleophile again, huh? did you? Um, now, we need to talk about this. So uh, we're actually going to spend a lot of time talking about this because we have talked about this enzyme that does this, hexokinase, before. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about why is magnesium in the active site? Well, that's a good question. Uh, hexokinase in general has really broad binding. So this is um, like hexokinase 1, 2, and 3. Uh, hexokinase 4, which is called glucokinase, is a little bit different. We're going to talk about those differences. But basically, it has a really low Km. And we learned before that having a low Km means you have a really, really good binding affinity. Um, that just means that you grab onto your substrate super duper well. And so in this case, hexokinase has a really low Km. So it can just be chewing through even really low concentrations of sugar. It's just chewing through that, going like crazy. It's awesome. It's how your cells are going to take sugar and turn it into uh, uh, energy. It's the absolute first step. So it's really, really important. So you want it working really, really well, even at low concentrations, because your cells always need sugar. It's really, really exergonic, okay? So we've got a nice negative 18.4 kilojoules per mole. That's really, really exergonic for, you're gonna just keep an eye on these delta Gs. Uh, I don't know if any of them get higher than that. I don't think they do. Um, that's super high. Uh, so it's essentially irreversible, even though it technically is reversible, but it, yeah, it's essentially irreversible. But what's also really, really important, this is the kind of double duty that you see inside cells. Like, yeah, you need to initiate this first step. You got to put some, spend some energy to get some energy out. Awesome. We appreciate all of that. But what's really cool is by phosphorylating your glucose, see, we're sticking this phosphate right here. Okay. By doing that, that puts a massive negative charge onto your glucose molecule. Glucose molecules by themselves are able to uh, diffuse through the plasma membrane. Okay? Now, if you need a bunch of them, you can put a transporter there or like a nice channel and let a bunch of glucose in. That's the job of uh, insulin. That's what insulin causes, uh, the creation of a nice transporter. Uh, well, it's, a, it's just a channel that lets a ton of glucose in. Um, and so it's facilitated diffusion. Uh, however, if I add a charge to glucose, it cannot pass back through the phospholipid bilayer because it's charged. Uh, we know that really large molecules and very charged molecules cannot pass through the phospholipid bilayer. So this first step sort of traps glucose inside the cell, which is super cool. Let's talk a little bit about hexokinase. So this is the first enzyme, and I promise I'm not spending uh, as much time as we're going to spend on hexokinase as I... Uh, let me rephrase that. We're going to spend way more time on hexokinase than a bunch of the other enzymes. So don't worry, I don't do this for every single one. But hexokinase is really important. Now, there are a bunch of different isoforms. Uh, so how do you make different isoforms? Well, that's a great question. So uh, probably alternative splicing. Um, they could probably come from different genes as well. Uh, but there are a bunch of them that ha do this first process. So um, hexokinase 1, 2, and 3 are your just normal intracellular hexokinases. They have really low KMs, okay? So uh, in the blue line here, that's a typical cellular hexokinase, okay? So just focus on that one. Super low KM, I don't even know why they label it here. Like the KM's like crazy low. Remember KM is half Vmax uh, on the concentration. And so they have a really low KM, which just means they bind to glucose super duper well. Um, and so uh, they're always doing their thing. Your cells are basically always uh, chopping up glucose uh, to turn it into energy for your cells because your cells just always need energy. Uh, and so uh, they're not, uh, your cells aren't really dealing with the, uh, should I store it in my liver or not? That is the job of hexokinase 4, otherwise known as glucokinase. Um, you will more often see it listed as glucokinase, um, especially when you're comparing the two, but it technically it's hexokinase 4. Um, it has different uh, control over itself. So, uh, Hexokinase, just hexokinase by normal hexokinase, um, one, two, and three, they're just typical enzymes. They, do, they just do a thing, they got their substrate, they chop it, or they add a phosphate, they do the thing, okay? Uh, notice they're kinases, so they're adding phosphates, right? Uh, now, hexokinase four uses hormone control as opposed to typical enzymatic control. So it has a different kind of activity curve. It's sigmoidal as opposed to... Uh, uh, I don't know, whatever that shape is. <laughs> um, 
uh, it does not have as good of an affinity for glucose, but that's okay. So what we do is we put glucokinase in the liver. That's where it's going to work. You don't want it grabbing as many glucose molecules as it possibly can and binding them super well and phosphorylating them as fast as you can. You kind of want it to, to have a more um, uh, stag staggered is the wrong word, like a more subtle approach to dealing with glucose. So it has a lower KM. So you'll see here, so in red is our glucokinase. And it has a much, uh, I'm sorry, a much higher KM. Man, I always mess that up. It has a higher KM, so it doesn't bind as well, right? So the smaller your KM, the better you bind. The larger your KM, the worse you bind. Now, I always want you to remember that doesn't, just because I say it's worse doesn't mean it's worse. It has its function. You don't want your liver taking glucose and treating it like this as fast as it can. You want it to kind of take its time because we might not want to send it into glycolysis. Maybe uh, we want to send our glucose into glycogenesis and make glycogen, which is a nice long-term polymer. Uh, so maybe I want to do that. And so you don't want to actively be phosphorylating it as fast as you can. Uh, but uh, basically glucokinase in your liver is the main way that you control your blood glucose levels, okay? Uh, I have another diagram here that talks a little bit more. Um, thank you to Draw to Know It again. Uh, they make awesome pictures. You should go on their website and spend money because they're awesome. Uh, but they have a bunch of free stuff too. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I did not pay for this, um, but I will give them the props. So uh, basically the main reason here, so I mean, there's that same diagram, uh, but why am I showing you this? Because inside cells you have hexokinases. Uh, you can inhibit those, uh, classic allosteric regulation, so uh, glucose 6-phosphate, which is what hexokinase makes, actually inhibits a hexokinase itself, uh, which is so weird. Uh, so this guy, glucose 6-phosphate, inhibits the enzyme that made it. Kind of weird, uh, but it's just a nice way to just kind of regulate what's happening. Okay. Uh, now, glucokinase in the liver is controlled by hormones, okay? So insulin, in addition to causing the generation of uh, glucose transporters in cells throughout the body also controls glucokinase and whether or not it's going to phosphorylate uh, the glucose. Because maybe you don't want it to, maybe you do want it to. Uh, the presence of glucagon can also uh, drop that. So it kind of depends on your blood sugar. So if you have high blood sugar, then you need to release insulin. If you have low blood sugar, you need to release glucagon to stop this. Uh, basically, um, Glucokinase, one of its main jobs is to send glucose into the formation of glycogen. But if you have really low blood glucose, well, if my blood glucose is low, I don't want to be making glycogen. I want to be using that glucose to uh, power my cells, right? So that's why if you have low blood glucose, you release glucagon and it stops your glucokinase. But if you have high blood glucose, well, you need to chew that stuff up so you activate it and you got, that basically means you have excess glucose and so you can send it into glycogen. That's totally fine. Okay. Now, Talk a little bit. This is going to look familiar. So when we talked about enzymes and thermodynamics and all that good stuff, we talked about hexokinase. This should look kind of familiar. Um, now, uh, looking at the delta Gs here, I realized, um, so before I said it was negative 18.4 kilojoules per mole. This one's negative 16.7. Uh, honestly, there's some variety. Uh, it depends on the cell type. I mean, there's four, at least four different kinds of hexokinases that I just mentioned. So it just kind of depends on how well they facilitate this, okay? But basically, um, why are we getting negative 16.7 well, or negative 18.4 or whatever? Uh, it's because the actual uh, removal of um, the spontaneity of <laughs> ATP going to ADP is really, really high, right? So it's negative 30. And then we're going to add that to our uh, glucose bonus, glucose 6-phosphate, which is non-spontaneous. But we're going to let that happen. It's going to happen. Awesome. We're going to stick that phosphate on. Now we need to talk about why did I mention earlier that you need magnesium in the active site. So recall, um, this is biochemistry, so we've talked about enzymes and enzyme structure and protein structure, and the active site structure is really, really important. So here's our ATP, and there's our glucose, and we need to take this phosphate and stick it on there. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have a nucleophilic attack. We're going to use these electrons to attack this phosphate. But look at all those oxygens with all those extra electrons on there, uh, on there, all that giant negative charge here is going to repel these electrons. And so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to use some nice positive charges to sort of pull those electrons away. We're going to pull that negative charge away. So that's why the active site of hexokinase has, among other things, magnesium ions to distract those electrons and kind of pull them apart. 
they pull them away and allow the nucleophilic attack to occur. And so then we're going to just reform, uh, so you can see here, uh, we're going to have these electrons go after this phosphate. So we're going to have to have a bond broken over here. We're going to lose that hydrogen. And uh, so we lose the hydrogen. We have a new bond formed. And we are now left with, well, I'm just going to cut to here. There's our phosphate attached here where the hydroxyl group used to be or the alcohol group, whatever you want to call it. Uh, awesome. That only happened uh, because um, we had magnesium in the active site. Moving on to reaction number two. So we have taken our glucose and we have phosphorylated. We, we have made a glucose six phosphate. So on the number six carbon, one, two, three, four, five, six. On the number six carbon is a phosphate. The names make sense. Now, uh, what enzyme did that? Hexokinase did that. Okay, now we're going to now use what has like three different names. So it depends on the textbook that you're reading. Uh, so it's G6P, so that's the shorthand version, G6P. Uh, so glucose 6-phosphate isomerase, right? otherwise known as phospho, okay, phospho, gluco, okay, gluco, sure, isomerase, okay, there's isomerase again, or phospho, okay, phosphate, hexose, which is another term for glucose because it, it's hexagonal isomerase, okay, so there's all these different terms that get thrown around, I, I'm i sorry, I'm <laughs> just sorry, just pick one, I like G6P isomerase because, I don't know, it's a G6P and it's an isomer, it's, it's an enzyme that's going to move things around. Basically, we're going to form a new bond. Uh, so what we need to do, uh, there are two things that need to happen, okay? So we need to kind of prep ourselves to phosphorylate. Uh, we want to add another phosphate onto um, this carbon and this hydroxyl group here. So what we're going to do is we're going to form a bond between our oxygen here and this carbon down here, the number two carbon, okay? And so it's going to kind of, kind of squish together. So you can see we go, it, now it's more pentagonal and it was hexagonal. So what's going on? Well, this carbon is going to, we're gonna take this bond, we're gonna slide it down here, and then this carbon is going to kind of stick off there. And so you can see we're prepping to phosphorylate. And so uh, the next step is going to phosphorylate here, and it looks exactly the same. So you can see this guy, we got this carbon sticking off with the hydroxyl group. Well, we just did that exact same thing again, but we have to do that, and so an enzyme is going to do that. What enzyme? Well, depends on what you want to call it, but it's an isomerase. We're changing it to an isomer. We're not adding a phosphate. We're not doing anything weird. We're not cutting anything. All we're doing is just kind of reforming it a little bit. So what's really happening? Well, we're moving the carbonyl oxygen from C1 to C2, which is much easier to phosphorylate. Awesome. Okay, so that's going to be easier to phosphorylate. Also, uh, reaction number four, so we're only around reaction two. Reaction number four is a very important reaction. It's this one where we're going to actually cleave this guy right down the middle. Okay, It will not happen properly uh, between the correct carbons unless we do this whole process. So once again, actually um, changing your isomer, going from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, because that's this uh, pentagonal structure, serves two purposes. It preps us for phosphorylation and it preps us for a symmetrical aldol cleavage, which makes me sound super smart, uh, but I'm gonna have to struggle to go through it and explain it, but I do sound smart right now, so that's awesome. Now notice your delta G is positive, so how are you gonna get by that? Well, you have a massive buildup earlier of your product, or your reactants, ah, man, or you pull your products away, okay? And it just kind of depends on the reaction. Just structurally to just kind of talk a little bit about what's going on. So. We're moving from a glucose molecule on the left to a fructose molecule on the right, and we're going to have some phosphates on there. So I just took a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule, uh, the two different uh, ways that we look at them. Um, you've got your Fisher projection and your, uh, I can't remember what the other, it, it's like more three-dimensional. I can't remember. Uh, but we already have a phosphate stuck up there, right? All right, we've got a phosphate up there. Uh, this is what it would look like if we made it linear. Okay, and I just kind of added this little guide here. Uh, that's where we're going to actually form... Uh, the bond. And so you would have um, this carbon, uh, this is the oxygen right here, and so that's where the bond would actually form. Okay. And so we've got that there, so this phosphate is this phosphate, okay, if that makes sense. <laughs> I hope so. Um, and so this is that same one, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of squish it over, and this guy goes, <laughs> moves over. <laughs> that was probably louder than it should have been. And then this a guy moves down, becomes a ketone, um, aldose, so it was on the end, uh, or I don't think an aldol, and then we're going to move it to a ketone, and because which our carbonyl is inside, right? 
and we're going to have our phosphate here, and we're about to phosphorylate this hydrogen, or stick it onto this oxygen, lose the hydrogen off. Why am I even talking about this? I don't know, let's keep going. So, we've prepped ourselves. We have our nice fructose. We've already phosphorylated one of those. Now we need to phosphorylate the other one, and that's the job of phosphofructokinase. Okay, so phospho, okay, phosphate. It's fructose, awesome, fructo, and it's kinase. So kinase is add phosphates, okay? So it's gonna add a phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, right? So we went from glucose 6-phosphate. We used our phosphohexose isomerase, or G6P isomerase. Turned it into fructose 6-phosphate, okay? Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. And we're just gonna phosphorylate again. So, uh, and we name it off of whatever carbon we're phosphorylating. So it's still fructose, awesome. And uh, we had a phosphate on the 6-carbon, right? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we're gonna add one to the 1-carbon. So it's fructose 1, six bisphosphate so bis meaning two okay um why do you have to say bisphosphate i don't know that's just kind of how we classically say it i don't think you really need to you could just say fructose one six phosphate but hey we'll honor our forefathers and use bis uh but that's fine uh so that's what we've been awesome uh shorthand fbp uh it's also super exergonic because we're breaking a phosphate or an atp right which is super exergonic um, and so basically it's, uh, irreversible once again, just like that first step. Um, and this enzyme itself, so phosphofructokinase is a really interesting enzyme and it's highly regulated by ATP. And so we want to, if I, if I turn it on with like AMP, cause I have a bunch of AMP around or a bunch of ADP sitting around. Awesome. I want to be able to turn that on. And once it's cruising, I can't go backwards. However, if I have a bunch of ATP around, I want to kind of downplay it, get it to turn off. And so this is a very important step because it is irreversible. Uh, it's a very important step in actual glycolysis. So I thought, you know, I'd show a nice little Khan Academy picture of some of this uh, control. Uh, we're going to talk at the end of the lecture actually about some of these levels of control. Uh, so don't worry too much, but I did want to expose you a little bit. So we're going to go glucose, uh, goes to glucose 6-phosphate, then to fructose 6-phosphate, and then fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, right? So it's kind of skipping over that step. Um, I, I put no going back, baby. Because once you jump from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, you can't go back, okay? So phosphofructokinase is the enzyme that does that. Adenosine monophosphate, so that means we've been chewing through ATP like crazy and we need more ATP. Well, we want to have glycolysis go. So we're going to control phosphofructokinase and kind of tell it to activate, do its thing. Uh, but if there's a ton of ATP around or a bunch of citrate, which would be the precursor to actually making a bunch more ATP, uh, if there's too much of that around, that means you're going through glycolysis maybe a little too fast. And so you need to kind of chill out a little bit. And so it would suppress the activity of phosphofructokinase. So let's jump into the next step. Reaction number four is arguably one of the coolest and most important reactions that you're going to encounter in glycolysis, okay? So what's going to happen is we're going to go from our fructose 1,6-bisphosphate Okay, so we went from glucose, we added a phosphate to the 6-carbon, and then we changed it to a fructose shape, basically, and then we added another phosphate. Okay, awesome. So uh, when we actually converted from glucose to fructose, that was really, really important. What did we do? Well, we moved that carbonyl one carbon down. So the carbonyl, the actual location of it on this chain is going to tell the enzyme in this reaction, so the aldolase, okay, so that's this guy, our aldolase, it's going to tell that aldolase where to cut. And we need to cut between uh, this oxygen and this carbon right here and these two carbons right here. Okay, it's very, very important that we cut there. Now, if we hadn't moved that carbonyl, we would cut in the wrong place. Okay, so let's talk about that quickly before I show you something else. So uh, we're going to cut right between the number three carbon, because I go one, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to cut between the three carbon and the four carbon, okay, because of the position of this carbonyl. This says, okay, it tells the aldol, hey, there's your carbonyl, go one, two carbons and cut between those two, okay? So if it was on the end, it would go, all right, go one, two and cut between these carbons. So we'd be between the two and the three carbon. Well, that would give you a four carbon molecule and a two carbon molecule. That's weird. I wouldn't know what to do with it. Your body doesn't either. So we move that carbonyl to the second carbon, which says, okay, go one, two and cut between those two. Awesome. So now I have two, one, two, three carbon molecules. One, two, three, one, two, three, okay? And there's your number one, two, three carbon from here, and there's your four, five, six from here. 
Awesome. So that is dihydroxyacetone, phosphate. Awesome. And glyceraldehyde, 3 phosphate. Cool. So that's kind of fun. Now, why is this called an aldolase that's doing this? Well, that's a good question. So um, <laughs> it's because it is similar to the reaction that occurs uh, for an aldol reaction. So a typical aldol reaction would be forming a carbon-carbon um, bond. So you kind of flip this guy on its side. This carbonyl ink sort of aims at this one, at this carbon, at this methyl group right here. And we uh, form a bond there. Okay. Um, and so, uh, well, sort of this like flings out and then you have a hydroxyl there. It looks like that. I don't know. And if you go the other way, <laughs> it's called a retroaldol or a reverse aldol reaction. So that's why, it, I mean, it, the, pre, the location of the carbonyl is really important. Okay. It says go uh, one, or it says go one, two, and cut there, right? So that's what I was talking about here, right? Uh, so we go one, two, and then cut between the two, right? So that's where the actual name of the enzyme comes from, okay? Sometimes people want to know. Um, at least my textbook thought that you wanted to know. Um, <laughs> so it has a massive positive delta G. Uh, now, that's under standard conditions, though. So uh, what I've been showing you are actually the standard conditions of delta Gs. Uh, so inside the cell, it's actually negative because uh, you have such a strong push, mostly a push, from this reaction before it, right? Because we said it was irreversible under physiological conditions. You're making tons of this guy, okay, FBP. And if you're making a ton of that, then it's going to keep building up and building up. And that forces your aldolase to actually go through with it. There's so much of its substrate around that it, it just happens to grab it and do its thing, which is really, really cool. We're left now with these two products. We've got G3P, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, and DHAP, which is dihydroxyacetone phosphate. We need to talk a little bit about what's happening next. Uh, so reaction number five only covers um, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, so our DHAP. So we make GAP and DHAP. I, I will often accidentally call GAP um, G3P. It's not, that's not the term you should use, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know why don't you don't call it G3P. I don't know. I think you can. I think that'd be fine. Anyway, so we made a gap and a uh, DHAP, and we need to change those into, uh, we need to turn dihydroxyacetone phosphate into GAP. <laughs> See, I almost called it G3P again. Uh, and so how are we going to do that? Well, we need to move some stuff around. And so we're going to use uh, an isomerase to do that again. So earlier we used uh, an isomerase to change our glucose into a fructose. And so we're just going to move things around. Um, and in, under intracellular conditions, I mean, we can basically do that uh, for free, kind of. Um, and so we're going to use triose phosphate isomerase, or TIM, the triose phosphate isomerase. Uh, why is it called that? Well, triose, so OS is sugar, tri, so it must have three carbons, so a three carbon sugar with a phosphate. Well, what do you know? One, two, three carbon sugar with a phosphate. Oh, triose phosphate isomerase. Well, here's our triose phosphate isomerase activity. And what I, the easiest way to follow this is to follow the double bond. So we've got our, um, it's in uh, our acetone, so it's a ketone, right? So it's ketone, right? So our carbonyl is inside where the carbons are. And we're going to flip our double bond up onto this carbon. And that's, uh, the oxygen gets upset because we broke one of his bonds. So we're going to put a little hydrogen on there, keep him happy. And then we're going to kind of flip out this double bond out here. And then this carbon gets upset because we just, it's only got three carbons. So we're going to tack a hydrogen on there and we have our carbonyl on the end. And now we now look like gap. Sweet. So these actually end up looking the same, which is awesome. That's what we want. Now, what I wanted to do is, uh, that's the end of the preparatory phase, the, energy input phase of glycolysis, whatever you want to call it. And so uh, I want to cut to a nice visual representation of what's happening. Now, I've gone to an, into a lot more detail, uh, but I wanted to just, I don't know, I'm kind of a visual movie kind of person. And so I wanted to cut to a really good video of what this looks like. Let's watch as these enzymes oxidize one glucose molecule into two pyruvate molecules. First, a kinase reaction adds a phosphate onto glucose to form glucose 6-phosphate. This is one of two energy consumption steps and is an irreversible reaction. Next, 
an isomerase reaction converts glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate by rearranging covalent bonds. Another kinase removes a phosphate group from ATP and gives it to fructose 6-phosphate to form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This is the second energy consumption step and an irreversible reaction. In the fourth step of glycolysis, a lyase reaction splits the 6-carbon fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into two 3-carbon sugars, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The dihydroxyacetone phosphate is rearranged by another isomerase to form a second glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. At this point in glycolysis, glucose has been metabolized into two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates and two ATPs have been consumed. So I hope that was uh, a helpful visual. There are lots of videos of glycolysis and all the steps. Um, there's a really good one from Harvard X or Harvard EDU. Um, there's this really good. This one's from North Dakota State University, which I like. There's a lot. They're virtual cell. Um, I've advertised for them before. Uh, great videos. Really, really nice. Uh, we're actually going to watch the second half uh, in a little while. Leaving the energy prep phase, the energy input phase, and we are now entering the energy output phase, the payoff phase, whatever you want to call it. So we've done five reactions so far. We're going to move on to reaction number six. And so this is where things start to pay off. It's going to be awesome. And remember, we now have two gaps, right? So we took our six carbon glucose and we have now cut it down the middle, basically. So, and then kind of move things around. And so we have a, uh, two gaps, each with phosphates, each have three carbons, okay? So we're going to send each of those through uh, this next process. And so we're going to use uh, gap is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, okay? We're going to use a dehydrogenase, and what we're going to do is we're going to generate our first um, non-ATP energy molecule. So that's NADH, nicotinamide adenine diphosphate with a hydrogen. <laughs> I think that's what it's called. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and we're going to do two things. So, <laughs> this... Enzyme is awesome. So GAP-DH is a really, really cool enzyme. So we're going to talk about it for a little bit because um, it's going to do two things. Not only are we going to take NAD and we're going to add a hydrogen and a bond. So we're basically taking electrons and putting them onto NAD plus to make NADH. Awesome. That's going to go into the electron transport chain and make three ATP. So that's worth three ATP. That's awesome. And we're going to do it twice. So that's going to give us six ATP total when we get to the electron transport chain. Pretty sweet. But the other thing that it's going to do is it's going to add another phosphate. So you can see here, here we've got our gap. Right? So we're going to take our gap and we're going to uh, tack on another phosphate right here. Okay? So now I already had one from earlier. So now I have two on each of these. And so we're going to, and remember there's two of these molecules, right? So I have one, two, and then I have the other one, three, four. So that's four separate phosphates that I'm then going to, through the process down below, take those phosphates and use substrate level phosphorylation to make ATP. Awesome. So that's where you would get those four ATP from. If you recall, uh, if we go backwards, we have our four ATP coming out of glycolysis. This is where we're going to actually get those at, which is really, really fun. GAP-DH has two big functions. We need to talk about those, okay? So let's go through the actual mechanism. Now, there are a lot of words here if you want to just kind of look at this and read through it. Uh, there's some terms that we haven't really talked about, like thiohemiacetal. Um, that's fine. I don't really care for this. Uh, what we need to talk about is what's happening. Okay, so here's our active site. So we start here. Okay? And notice we've got our cysteine in our active site, which cysteine, we know, we've learned, uh, has a sulfur. And sulfur is a really interesting atom. And sulfur allows us to basically form... Uh, thiol bonds, so those are, uh, they're covalent bonds, but they're relatively weak. Uh, they're easier to break apart, okay? And so we have that in our active site, which is pretty common. You'll see a lot of cysteines uh, with sulfur residues in active sites. And there's our NAD+, plus, okay? Because we need to tack a hydrogen onto that NAD+, plus to make it NADH uh, with some electrons. And so we're going to do that. So here's our, our gap comes in here, binds. So there's the phosphate on one end, and there's our, our carbonyl here on here. And so we're going to have uh, uh, some electrons go on to this oxygen, makes it negative, and we're basically forming a bond with this sulfur. So we're uh, the activity, uh, the reactivity of that sulfur is what allows us to sort of hold the um, gap in place, and that allows us to uh, 
take this hydrogen off of this carbon. Okay, so it's the, the hydrogen that's stuck off of this guy, this carbon, uh, this hydrogen right here. Okay, we're going to use that and we're going to take that hydrogen off and make NADH. Okay, so that falls off. Now, the actual physical structure of NADH, it's, it's a very large molecule. Okay, and by adding that hydrogen, all we have to do is add that hydrogen that makes it unfavorable to hang out inside the actosite here. So it falls out. Okay, so that's what's happening here. And it gets replaced by NAD because this, this portion of this active site is really, really strongly attractive to NAD+. Okay? So it probably has a couple of negative charges in there. And then advantage of something strange. So we've made our NADH awesome. That is really great. We're going to use that to make some ATP. Now, there is inorganic phosphate floating around. Okay, These are phosphates here. So we got a phosphate with five bonds, which is absolutely crazy. And these oxygens have extra electrons too kind of goofy and what they're going to do is they're going to attack this carbon okay uh, because it's preferential for them to attack this carbon and for this carbon to lose its bond back to the sulfur okay the sulfur is fine with that uh, the sulfur has a weaker uh, attraction to the carbon than the actual oxygen on the phosphate and that's how we're going to get an extra phosphate actually attached to our gap so now we've gone from carbon 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 here we've got that carbon so now we've attached uh, so, well, phosphate, carbon, carbon, carbon. Now we're going to do phosphate, carbon, one, two, three, phosphate. Okay, so it's gone from uh, our <laughs> glyceraldehyde three phosphate, right? Because it's on the third. Oh, we count from this direction. I'm sorry. So we have one, two, three carbon. Okay, so we're going to stick a phosphate now onto the number one carbon. My bad. I was counting them wrong. So we have our three, two, one carbons. The number three carbon is a phosphate, and then we're going to stick a phosphate on the number one carbon. So now, and then we had to add that bis, right? And it's a glycerate now. That's just the, the actual structure of it. Um, and so I know, I don't know why, why is it glyceraldehyde going to glycerate? That's just what we're going to call it. We're going to call it phosphoglycerate, okay? It's one, three, uh, there's a one, two, three, bis phosphoglycerate, right? So one, three, bis phosphoglycerate, because there's a phosphate on each of those. Okay. Whoo, man. Here's the actual structure of the active site, so it's kind of awesome. Uh, this is GAP-VH, okay? there's your inorganic phosphate, uh, which we said it's the P with a little I, the I stands for inorganic, so that means it's not like attached to anything, it's just floating around. And there's your NAD+, plus is gonna be, uh, this is your NAD+, plus, and then your um, uh, actual GAP is gonna come in here, do its thing, and then get released. Okay? So adding that inorganic phosphate onto that molecule um, causes it to uh, be ejected from the active site. It doesn't want to stay in there anymore. This enzyme gap EH, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Well, we took a hydrogen off of it. We added a phosphate as well, but we kind of name it after that. We took a hydrogen off and threw it on the NAD and made NADH. Awesome. So next step, let's kind of cruise through these. So we need to start doing some substrate level phosphorylation. So that's opposed to oxidative phosphorylation. So in the electron transport chain, that's where we take hydrogens, put them on one side of a membrane from our NADHs and our FADH2s, and we allow those to pass through the membrane. That's oxidative phosphorylation because we need oxygen to do it. Uh, if we're going to use an enzyme to physically remove a phosphate from our molecule and stick it onto ADP to make ATP, uh, we're using it. This is our substrate, and so it's substrate level phosphorylation as opposed to oxidative. Okay? So we need to do that, and we're going to do it uh, a total of four times, we have two of these molecules, right? So each molecule is going to have each of these phosphates ripped off, okay? And so the first one that does that is PGK. So phosphoglycerate, okay, that's because that's what this is, kinase, uh, PGK, it's going to use some magnesiums to kind of hold onto those phosphates, and uh, we're going to, I'm going to show you a picture of what it looks like in a second, and we're going to take that phosphate off, stick it onto ADP, and make ATP, okay? And that's going to then become um, uh, 3PG, <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate. Right, so we're going to lose the bis because there's we're going to take one of those phosphates, so the bis goes away, and we're taking the number one carbon phosphate off. So we're left with 3-phosphoglycerate. Okay, so it's really not that different of a, a name. You know, it's BPG, bis-phosphoglycerate, going to 3PG. Okay, pretty cool. It is reversible, and so uh, because it's reversible, uh, going in this direction, uh, uh, the other direction, it's a kinase. So kinases take phosphates and stick them onto molecules. We're kind of doing the opposite. So um, kinases normally take a phosphate from ATP and stick it on this one, right? So we're going the other direction. We're taking 
a phosphate from something and sticking it onto ATP and making ATP. So, um, but the reversible reaction is a kinase, and so that's why it's called phosphoglycerate kinase. Oh, these have really high gram, uh, high phosphoryl group transfer potential. What does that mean? Well, this is a super endergonic process. It wants to happen. Okay. And so we're just going to use our active site. So we're, we're inside our phosphoglycerate kinase right now. Uh, there's our ADP with our phosphates. And so it's really hard. We need to take these, uh, this negative charge here. It's going to be pushing away the negative charges on this phosphate that we're trying to get stuck onto this phosphate up here. And so we're going to use our magnesiums just like we did earlier in our active site to sort of pull those uh, negative charges away, which allows us to go from 1,3 bis phosphoglycerate to 3 phosphoglycerate. Okay? Awesome. So let's keep going. <laughs> these next step, couple steps are a little goofy, because, <laughs> but it's worth it because we're going to get some ATP out. But it's kind of goofy. So we have our phosphate. Uh, on this end, we got rid of it. Okay, awesome. Now we have this phosphate, but it's unfavorable in its current position to remove it and stick it onto an ADP. Okay, so what we need to do is get it into a more favorable position. So we're going to use phospho. Okay, so we got a phosphate. Glycerate, that's what this molecule is, phosphoglycerate mutase. And so what we're going to do is we need to move this phosphate to this carbon. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, this carbon. So we're going to take this phosphate, stick it on here, and then we're left with uh, this hydroxyl group. See, it looks like it moves over here, and this phosphate, it looks like it moves over here. Well, what's actually happening? Uh, let's talk about that. So if we go into the actual phosphoglycerate mutase active site, what we see is a histidine. Okay, So we got our histidine, and our histidine has a phosphate attached. And so here's our 3PG sitting right here. There's the phosphate. Okay, so we're looking at this molecule right here. So it, it's oriented a little diff different, but there's the carbon with the phosphate, okay? Carbon with the phosphate. And there's our, our alcohol group right there. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to stick a phosphate onto there and have the alcohol or the hydrogen fall off, okay? And then we're going to have this phosphate stick onto the histidine. So you're kind of swapping where the phosphate is so we're not taking this one and sticking it onto here. Okay? We're taking this one, sticking it on the, that spot, and replacing it with the one from this carbon. Isn't that weird? So we're going from three phosphoglycerate, so one, two, three, because we always carbon from the carbonyl. So one, two, three, okay, phosphoglycerate to two, two phosphoglycerate. But I wanted to dispel the notion that we're just kind of taking it and grabbing it, ripping it off the number three carbon and sticking it onto the number two. That is what's sort of happening, but it's a little more complicated than that. But this is kind of cool. I, I don't know why. I just really like that one. Um, it is mildly unfavorable, but you make so much 3PG, so that's, that's this one. You make so much of this that uh, it's favorable to actually be pushed in this direction towards 2PG. Uh, so that's kind of awesome. We're actually almost done. This is awesome. Uh, so we're going to move on to reaction number nine. Okay, so it turns out um, so that 2PG uh, does not have as high a transfer potential, okay, uh, and it's because this hydroxyl group is in the way. We don't like him, okay. It's uh, when we're trying to react with our uh, ADP and get that phosphate off, it's preferentially reacting with this hydroxyl group, so we need to get rid of it, okay. And so what we're going to use is enolase. I, I describe it here, but let's, uh, let me show you a little picture here. So. Um, What's going on here? There's all kinds of arrows, all kinds of crazy stuff, but basically in the active site, okay, so uh, there's our nice molecule, there's three carbons, one, two, three, and there's our phosphate sticking off. So we got one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, and on that number three carbon is that really annoying alcohol group. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our lysine residue to uh, sort of pull this hydrogen away. Okay, so this hydrogen away, and that forms a double bond. Okay, so we got this nice double bond here. Okay. And then we're going to form a double bond between these two carbons, so your number three, uh, yeah, one, two, your number two, and your number three carbon. Okay, so we're going to flip that out. Okay. Now notice uh, I had to sort of balance out these negative charges because I added a bunch of negative charge on this end. So you need the magnesiums here to sort of balance that out, so you can do some stuff over here. Otherwise, you would probably flip uh, this uh, double bond out to one of these guys, okay, and form more double bonds. And so that would be bad. And so you kind of balance out that negative charge with these positive charges so that you can do stuff in the center of the molecule. Now we need to get rid of this alcohol group. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna have it fall off, combine it with a hydrogen, uh, which is sort of being stored on this glutamate, and that makes water. Awesome, there's a water molecule. 
uh, and that's just really cool. So in the active site, the actual um, amino acids are really, really important. If you don't have a lysine at position 345 and a glutamate at 211, then you're not going to be able to do this process and you're just kind of screwed, like you can't do this. So we're going to go from 2-phosphoglycerate, and so on, 2-phosphoglycerate, to phosphoenol pyruvate. This is an enol, okay? And uh, we've got our phospho up there, and we've got our enol pyruvate. So we're almost pyruvate, okay? So we actually just need to lose our phosphate to get our pyruvate molecule, which is the molecule that we're then going to send through uh, the acetyl-CoA production process. So the generation of pyruvate is basically what we're aiming at. I have a little diagram here. I, I mentioned it just a second ago that uh, this double bond would much rather be on these oxygens than between the two carbons. That's really weird. Um, and so why is that? Well, normally we would do that. That's the keto form of the tautomer. So tautomers, same atoms, just different arrangements. And so um, we rapidly go back and forth between the two, but we prefer the keto form, okay? And so what we're going to do is we need to kind of lock it in place. And so what we're going to do is we've got our double bonded carbon to carbon here. We're going to flip out that double bonded carbon out to this oxygen that's going to allow us to have this phosphate fall off because this oxygen is going to be double bound to this carbon and so it's much more likely to um, it's happier that way than having these two bonds like this and so it's much easier to have the phosphate fall off left with this molecule okay and this is we called an enol and <laughs> this double bond is highly unfavorable Okay, so that's why we're able to get like a negative delta G up here from, from this whole process. So it does not like this at all. It wants to fling this double bond over to this oxygen, okay? That oxygen has way more electronegativity than this carbon, and so it's really kind of pulling on this guy. Because uh, the phosphate, yeah, he's fine. He doesn't, he doesn't really need to be bound to this oxygen, and so it really wants this to happen. And so that's what we're kind of taking advantage of is the fact that this really wants to happen. Last reaction, we're almost done. So our last reaction, we need to take that phosphate that's sticking right here, right? We want to take this phosphate and we want to put it onto ADP. And so the, the we made this crazy enol that really wants to have this double bond flip over there. Well, guess what? That's what happens. So this is so favorable and powerful to flip this way that it happens. It has a massive negative delta G. Look at that. Almost 30, that's crazy to actually make this ATP. Uh, so we're going from uh, uh, our phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate, okay, still three carbons, okay? but notice we've got this double bond here. It's going to flip onto this oxygen, balance that out, and that phosphate falls right off. Awesome. So yeah, just kind of look real close at that, okay? We got a double bond, and it's going to flip onto this oxygen, okay? Double bond is going to flip onto that oxygen, and that phosphate is going to fall off. We're going to stick it onto a DP to make ATP, and we're left with a pyruvate molecule. It's super favorable to do this. Um, <laughs> I kind of wrote this goofy. I even said, boom, we quickly do the jump to the keto form. <laughs> uh, so you're actually going from this one, and it's going, and it's jumping way over here. But because we have created this form, it really wants to go this way. And so um, think about like if 99.999% of the time you want to jump from your enol form to your keto form that's a form of potential energy. So if I make this form, it really wants to get over here. And so that's where we're getting this energy from, which is really, really cool. Uh, now that's performed by pyruvate kinase. Once again, um, kinases normally take ATP, take the phosphate off and stick that phosphate onto something. Um, that pyruvate kinase does do that, but that's the reverse direction. We're actually talking about the other direction where it's phosphorylating ADP, which is not what kinases do. Uh, they usually use ATP, uh, but in this case we're making ATP, but that's fine uh, because it does go in the other direction and that's why it got its name. So pyruvate kinase does that. So uh, to, uh, to end for today, I want to end on the second half of that video. Um, we are going to next time be talking about uh, some of the control levels for glycolysis. Uh, so, uh, because I've already been talking for like an hour and we should just be done now. Uh, so we're going to talk about more of the control levels and we're going to talk about the next step, which is taking pyruvate and either sending it through fermentation or sending it into uh, acetyl-CoA and then into the citric acid cycle and then into the electron transport chain. So we're going to follow the path of pyruvate. The next five steps of glycolysis are the energy producing phase. 
In step 6, both glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates are oxidized to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate by a dehydrogenase. This step produces 1 NADH for each oxidized glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, for a total of 2 NADHs. These NADHs are later used to produce more ATP for the cell. In step 7, a kinase transfers a phosphate from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to ADP to form ATP and 3-phosphoglycerate. This step is reversible even though ATP is formed. The next step involves a mutase reaction that moves the phosphate on the third carbon of 3-phosphoglycerate to the second carbon position to form 2-phosphoglycerate. In step 9, a lyase reaction removes water from 2-phosphoglycerate to form phosphoenyl pyruvate. In the final step of glycolysis, a kinase reaction removes the phosphate group from phosphoenyl pyruvate and donates it to ADP to form ATP and pyruvate. Like reactions 1 and 3, this step is irreversible. At this point, two pyruvate molecules, four ATPs, and two NADHs are formed for each glucose that was broken down in glycolysis. The pyruvates and NADHs could be used in aerobic respiration to produce more energy for the cell.